Uh, she's a return player. She came uh, back from April 2021. Uh, Lisa Upton joined us back then, and she uh, had the lecture, The Sun, Space Weather, and the Solar Activity Cycle. Well, now we're well into that cycle, and uh, it's it's been amazing. If you play with ham radio, it's a great time to have ham radio. It's a great time, as you saw with Franco's pictures, too, to be taking pictures of the sun. And uh, this 11-year cycle is, is definitely a big one. Well, a little bit of back, uh, background on Dr. Upton. Uh, she's an accomplished scientist who made significant contributions to our understanding of the sun, and she is currently a lead scientist at Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado. And she picked up a PhD in physics from Vanderbilt University in 2014, where at the time she was working on cutting edge model of the evolution of the sun's photospheric magnetic field. Now her research interests include understanding the solar dynamo, solar cycle viability, or variability, and the impact of the sun earth environment. In particular, she's interested in observing solar flows in active regions, as well as modeling magnetic flux transport on the sun. And in particular, she's interested in advancing Sun-Earth system research by bridging the solar interior and the solar atmosphere with her model in order to improve space weather and space climate predictions. Uh, the rest, we're going to just let her take away here because I just want to get right to the talk. Please welcome back to the Westport Astronomical Society's free lecture series, Dr. Lisa Upton. Welcome back. Thank you so much uh, for such a wonderful introduction. It's a, a pleasure to, to be back and, and visiting uh, all of you here at Westport, uh, such a, a great group of uh, uh, astro astronomers here. And I really enjoyed uh, seeing all of those uh, uh, fantastic images. Oh, Franco, I'm, I'm so impressed with uh, uh, that active region. Uh, it was just stunning, the, the prominence. You've you just done some really uh, amazing uh, work. So uh, definitely appreciate that. So thank you uh, very much for inviting me to uh, return. Uh, I'm going to be, uh, let me just share screen here real quick. All right. And make sure that you guys can see. Okay. Everybody seeing the screen. All right. Yes. Okay. And I'll just add uh, just real quickly. Uh, I have had some technical difficulties. So if my uh, computer drops out, I will return. Please just uh, bear with me. Uh, okay, so uh, last time I was here, uh, uh, I talked about uh, the sun, space weather, and the solar activity cycle. Uh, it was really uh, uh, a, an introduction to the sun, uh, really just a, 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 a catch-all of all the various different activity that we see on the sun, uh, how that activity translates into to space weather, uh, the, the solar cycle. I shared with you uh, some of the research that I've been doing on the solar cycle. Uh, and uh, the solar cycle prediction uh, that uh, I, I helped curate at the solar cycle minimum. So I'm not going to, to go into quite as much detail on a lot of the introductory material, but uh, as, a, uh, as was previously, previously mentioned, uh, you can go to the YouTube page there and, and see that video there. If you want a, a general introduction to the sun, uh, it's uh, definitely a great place to start uh, uh, to, to get some background on it. So today I'm going to do something uh, a little bit different. I will give you guys a little bit of an update on Solar Cycle 25, although that's going to come a little bit uh, later in the talk. Uh, but I'm actually going to talk to you uh, about uh, NASA's Heliophysics Big Year. And so uh, this is uh, an initiative uh, that uh, uh, NASA has launched uh, back in uh, October of 2023. So it's been ongoing uh, for several months uh, already. And, and basically, uh, you know, there's a lot going on with the sun this year, uh, last year and this year, and, uh, and, and great reasons to celebrate solar science and, and the sun's influence on on the Earth. Uh, and so uh, they've uh, coordinated this Heliophysics Big Year, which has several uh, uh, very big uh, milestones in uh, the solar community uh, and in solar physics. And in addition to that, uh, they've created uh, themes for each month, uh, inviting everyone to come and share uh, in their love of the sun uh, and, and, and uh, the, the science that we're, we're doing uh, for the sun. So uh, with uh, all kinds of opportunities for such as uh, you know eclipse viewing, citizen science projects, uh, really just inviting everyone to participate. And and even if you you don't really have a science background, uh, they're they're just so inclusive, in, including all kinds of different activities, dance, fashion, sustainability, and more. 
Uh, if you go to uh, the uh, Heliophysics uh, Big Year, NASA's Heliophysics Big Year uh, site, there's a link here at, at the bottom of the screen, uh, you can see what uh, the, the months are for the, the next uh, several months for the remainder of this year. Uh, and you can see there's just a, a, a big variety here. So obviously, uh, April 2024 uh, coming up, uh, we've got a, uh, the total solar eclipse on April 8th. Uh, May is going to be visual art, so celebrating art uh, in all kinds of uh, uh, visual forms, uh, depictions. Uh, June is performance art, July, physical and mental health. How does, uh, you know, how do uh, our connections with the sun uh, relate to physical and mental health? Uh, uh, you know, we, we really, uh, you know, require that vitamin D to, to keep us in good spirits, but, you know, also solar inspired sports teams, sun, sun themed meditations, things like that. August, uh, celebration of uh, back to school with activities specifically for kids. Uh, September, environment uh, and sustainability. Uh, October, uh, solar cycle and solar max. Uh, that's a big one for me. Uh, November, bonus science. And uh, rounding out the, the end of the year uh, with uh, uh, Parker's per perihelion uh, coming in December of 2024. Uh, so today, I really want to focus on a few uh, of the select themes. So I'm going to focus on uh, the solar eclipse uh, coming up uh, next month, uh, the, uh, the the theme for uh, May of 2024, the visual art theme. I've been doing some interesting art, and I'd like to to share that with you. Uh, and then October, uh, again, uh, Solar Cycle and Solar Max, that's my jam right there. So I've got a lot to say about that. And uh, and then in December, I'll just kind of touch on uh, Parker's, uh, uh, what's going on with Parker's solar probe and, and kind of give you some uh, things to think about there uh, if you want to go and explore that further. All right, so without further ado, let's uh, get started. I'm gonna go in order of the themes. Uh, so it might be, uh, you know, some things might be, you know, better later or, or, or further on, but uh, hopefully uh, the order will uh, 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 won't be too disjointed. All right, so let's start with uh, April 2024, uh, the total solar eclipse. Uh, so if uh, uh, you know, you're not aware, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the moon is going to be going uh, directly between uh, the Earth and the sun, uh, and it's going to uh, block out uh, the sun's, uh, the, the main uh, body of the sun in entire uh, and when it does this, uh, this is called a total solar eclipse. And there's a big difference between a partial solar eclipse and a total solar eclipse. A uh, partial solar eclipse uh, is only where a small fragment uh, uh, or a large fragment of the sun is obscured by the uh, the moon. But when, when you have just the right alignment, you can block out the sun entirely. Uh, and it's just such a phenomenal experience. Uh, many of you may have experienced it in 2017. We had uh, uh, our, our great American eclipse uh, several years ago. I was uh, fortunate to experience that. That was my first uh, uh, total solar eclipse. And it's just a, such a phenomenal experience. Uh, so coming up uh, here in uh, a few weeks, we've got another uh, uh, total solar eclipse coming. Uh, and uh, the, the path of totality is spanning across many cities across the, the country. And so lots of opportunity to uh, observe uh, this cool phenomenon. The next uh, total solar eclipse is not going to happen in the U.S., I think, for another uh, 20 years. So uh, definitely uh, uh, want to take uh, advantage of this opportunity while we can. Uh, for Connecticut, uh, where Westport uh, is located, uh, it, uh, it is in the, the path of the eclipse, but unfortunately, it's not really in the path of totality. You guys are, are, are going to be able to experience partiality. Uh, and then to give you kind of a, a sense of, uh, you know, how much you might uh, expect uh, in Westport, uh, uh, you know, here's a list of uh, several uh, towns and cities in Connecticut and, and how much obscuration you might expect. Uh, you can get this information uh, from timeanddate.com. Uh, uh, and and uh, so in Westport, you're, you're going to get about 90% uh, obscuration. So uh, a good uh, solid chunk of the, the sun is going to be uh, blocked out. But there's a, a new uh, image, uh, a figure that really came uh, that came out, I think, yesterday or, or today. And it just really resonated with me. And I really just want to convey this to you. And, and this is an image called the... Um, 
uh, let's see, what is it? The uh, the, the 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 image. Uh, what is it? Uh, the the eclipse map, the Nope map for the the Great American Eclipse. And basically, what this is illustrating is is that to really experience the, a, this eclipse to the the fullest, you really really want to be in that path of totality. Uh, you know, seeing an eclipse, uh, you know, outside of the path of totality, certainly you'll get to uh, see a large amount of the sun. Uh, blocked off. But the difference between a partial eclipse and a total solar eclipse is literally like the difference between night and day, because uh, a total solar eclipse uh, is going to, to completely obscure uh, the main body of the sun uh, to such an extent that it'll actually appear like it's becoming dark uh, outside. Uh, whereas a, a partial eclipse, even if it's a 90% partial eclipse, it, it is only going to seem a, a like a dimming, as if a, a cloud has passed in, in, in front of the sun, uh, almost in terms of the amount of light that you're, you're seeing around you. Uh, so there's such a huge difference. In a path of totality, uh, it will get uh, uh, dark uh, as if it were going to be night. Uh, I've uh, read that uh, the uh, the uh, comet that uh, we, we saw a, a very beautiful image of earlier today might actually be uh, visible uh, during uh, the totality. So so if you're interested, uh, maybe take some binoculars, try to touch, uh, check that out. That would be really cool. But even beyond that, uh, the, the wildlife around, uh, you know, they, they respond to this, this, this sudden change uh, in the environment. And, and it's just such a such a awe-inspiring uh, uh, experience. So I really encourage you, uh, you know, if it is at all possible make the effort to get to the path of totality. It's just such, uh, such a phenomenal experience to see uh, totality that I really, really can't uh, emphasize enough. Uh, you guys are fortunate that uh, you're not terribly far uh, from uh, the path of totality. It is about a four and a half uh, uh, hour drive. I think, uh, you know, Syracuse, you just kind of barely get into the edge, but you really want to push a little bit further, maybe up closer to, you know, Buffalo, Rochester, Niagara, then you're, you're, you're on that line of totality. And so you'll get to experience this phenomena for, for a longer period of time. So uh, close to the, the center line here, you'll get uh, uh, three to four minutes uh, of uh, totality. Uh, and as you move to the edge of totality, uh, that time will diminish. And so uh, really four and a half hour drive, so totally worth it. If you've not uh, experienced a, a, to, uh, a total solar eclipse uh, before, really, really, really have to emphasize, make that effort, go to the path of totality. It, 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 it's just such a phenomenal experience. You, 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 won't, uh, you won't regret that. Uh, so uh, uh, adding on to that, I want to add that even if you did get to experience the eclipse in 2017, uh, the eclipse that we're going to have in uh, this year is going to be very different than the eclipse that we had uh, in, in 2017. And, and the reason for that is because of where we are in the solar cycle. Uh, at solar cycle, at the last uh, solar eclipse in 2017, uh, we were near the time of solar cycle minimum. Uh, the sun was in a very dipolar state. It was very much in a magnetic field configuration, just like a bar magnet. And you can see that in images uh, that people People took of the eclipse at that time. You can see these, these streams coming out of the top and the bottom, uh, very much looking like uh, what you would see if you uh, sprinkled uh, iron filings around uh, a bar magnet, this very dipolar uh, configuration. The eclipse uh, that we're going to experience next month uh, is going to be very different because we're uh, going to be at the time uh, of uh, around solar cycle maximum. And so this magnetic field uh, on the sun is going to be in a much more complicated configuration. And so we might expect to see uh, streams like this uh, radiating around the entire, uh, entire disk. So instead of just having uh, streams like this out to the side uh, with the, the poles, uh, uh, the open field coming out of either poles, you might see something that looks like uh, these streams uh, forming a, a crown around the sun, uh, which gives it the, the, you know, the corona its name, right? Uh, so the sun will be very different than the last eclipse. If you can make it, do please make the effort to, to go and see it. it it's, it will be phenomenal. 
Okay, so the next uh, topic I want to, to touch on, moving uh, uh, on in the heliophysics big year, is uh, the topic of uh, visual art. Uh, and I'll start by, you know, talking about, uh, you know, a little bit of, uh, you know, showing some uh, examples of uh, uh, where the sun has influenced visual art over the time, uh, over time. So, uh, you know, here is a, an ornamental headdress uh, from uh, Colombia from the first to 17th century. And you see this headdress, uh, these streams uh, are these uh, horns here kind of re resemble these, these, these streams coming off of the sun. Uh, ancient petroglyphs uh, uh, depict the sun. Uh, this, uh, these petroglyphs were uh, uh, found in uh, Chaco Canyon in New Mexico and are actually believed to have been made uh, following an eclipse. It's, uh, they believe that the, this image uh, particular uh, uh, depicts an eclipse uh, with a possible coronal mass ejection uh, being uh, sent off uh, uh, into the heliosphere uh, uh, at this latitude. Uh, down here at the bottom, another eclipse-inspired uh, uh, artwork. This is a, a wool quilt dating back to 1876, and it's just amazing to see uh, the level of uh, detail. I think this was a, uh, a teacher, uh, a science teacher, who was interested in uh, uh, you know, illustrating the solar system to her students, and so she made this elaborate quilt uh, depicting uh, the sun and the, the, the solar system. Uh, and then we can move into to modern, uh, more traditional type art. Uh, Vincent van Gogh was no stranger uh, to the sun. Uh, this image uh, here uh, is a, a picture called the sower at uh, uh, the sower at sunset. Uh, an image he painted in 1888. Uh, he was particularly struck by the vibrant yellow of the sun and really uh, uh, tried to capture that. And, and, and really, you can see, uh, you know, there's so much uh, uh, variation in the colors and the use of white to really bring out uh, uh, that, uh, that yellow in the, in the image. Uh, here is uh, an acrylic on canvas, another eclipse-inspired uh, uh, image uh, that was uh, created in 1970. Uh, and even, uh, you know, the Smithsonian, the logo for the Smith. Smithsonian is the form of the sun uh, dedicated to, to, to uh, remind people that they're dedicated to enlightening audiences everywhere. And so really you see the sun taking, uh, see, see the sun in, in art in all kinds of different forms, uh, including uh, photography. Uh, this is uh, an image of an eclipse uh, that was taken last year, and so this might be more representative of what we might uh, expect to see in the solar eclipse next month. Again, as I mentioned, rather than you know clear, distinct streams are you know uh, uh, coming out or clear, distinct uh, 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 streams coming out of the the poles, you'll see these these. Um, uh, streamers coming out of uh, all the sides, kind of uh, forming uh, streamers all, all the way around the, the surface of the sun. So a very different form. Uh, you can see a little bit of a, a CME right here, just a phenomenal piece of photography. Uh, but uh, I think you uh, you have uh, avid photographers in your midst as well. Uh, this is a very beautiful picture of the sun. Uh, so much detail, so much structure. Uh, you can uh, uh, catch glimpses of some active regions here, uh, solar pro prominence here. Uh, and this one is actually one from your own uh, Franco Fella. So uh, this was taken in hydrogen uh, alpha uh, uh, in December of uh, 2020, uh, 2023, last year. So just, just this last winter. And just such a stunning way. Uh, to express uh, uh, the sun in the, this photographic media. So I do yes. have, oh, yes, yes, please go ahead. That picture of the streamer that you had, uh, one back, do you know the kind of uh, filter system that was used to acquire that? Uh, this is actually uh, a composite of several different filters. The name of uh, this particular photographer, he's actually a solar uh, physicist, a solar scientist, uh, Druck Mueller, and he's been uh, eclipse chasing. Uh, he goes to many, many eclipses uh, and, and has a, just a phenomenal setup. He actually uh, was a, a composite uh, with some, a couple other uh, solar physicists as well. Uh, if you go to his website, uh, you know, he, he's got uh, you know, dozens of eclipse uh, photography images and he'll have the details uh, of what particular filters were used. I think, uh, you know, he had some iron filters. Um, 
I don't remember all the different filters that were used in this composite, but uh, it is a composite. Uh, if uh, you'd like, I'm happy to, to give you the link uh, afterwards. I can uh, post that in the, uh, the chat for you to go and, and check it out. Stunning, stunning photography. So definitely uh, recommend that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, so uh, yeah, as I mentioned, I've recently developed a new artistic uh, uh, hobby of my own, and I'd love to share it with uh, you today. I've been uh, having a lot of fun creating art with Dolly. Uh, this is uh, OpenAI's AI image uh, generator. I don't know if you, uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, 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 AI and, and the advancements that have been taking place over the last year, but it's really been uh, a revolution uh, in terms of technological advances and what they've been able to do. Uh, so uh, OpenAI uh, is, is most well known for its uh, uh, large language model uh, called ChatGPT, which is an interface where you can, uh, you have like a text, uh, or a, a, a box to, to input text and ask questions and much like you would uh, a search engine. Uh, but rather than getting out a list of, of pages uh, that uh, you have to go in and parse all of the information, it, it does all of that for you. It goes through and it parses the information and it provides you with a cohesive uh, summary uh, of what it is that you've asked. So it's a really powerful tool. Uh, in addition to the, 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 the chat GPT, the um, large language model, they've also been working uh, with a, uh, an image, gener uh, creating an image generator that they've named Dali, a play of, right. of uh, the name Salvador Dali, uh, spelled D-A-L-L-E. I'm sorry, what was that? Was there a question? No question. I, I saw Steve pop up there for a second. Okay. There was an error. I apologize. Oh, no worries. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, I've been having a lot of fun uh, placing uh, uh, with this. And and so it, it's a similar kind of uh, setup where you have a, a search with a box or a text box uh, where you just type in a, a phrase or a description. And, and rather than, you know, uh, giving you text as an output, it will give you uh, an image as an output. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, these images. I uh, was playing with the concept of uh, the solar spectrum, and I wanted to, to create an image uh, illustrating, uh, you know, the, the solar spectrum radiating out of, of the sun. And I just thought these were just very beautiful, very striking, uh, such an interesting and unique way to, to illustrate, uh, you know, these various wavelengths that we uh, observe on the sun. Uh, another concept that uh, I, I was interested in is, is, is the idea of uh, the fractal sun. You know, when we observe the sun, we see that there's all kinds of different structures, spatial, uh, temporal scales, uh, you know, the, the, the convection that occurs on the sun. You have these large, uh, large giant uh, convective structures and going down to super granules and, and smaller and smaller scales, granular scale. And that, and that to me was reminiscent of, uh, uh, of fractal patterns. And so I, I created these images uh, uh, with uh, that concept uh, in mind. Um, you know, expanding out into, you know, what, uh, what you know, creating images of the sun that represent the entire solar system. So uh, seeing the sun as the, the focal point in our solar system with all of these orbiting bodies uh, displayed colorfully. Uh, and then uh, most recently, uh, images of the eclipse. Uh, I, I thought these were just very uh, cool. The the, the the way that the colors were were uh, formed, the the level of detail, uh, in particular, looking at these these wild creatures here, uh, you know, responding to the eclipse. And this is something you know, having experienced the twenty seven eclipse uh, and seeing uh, the the uh, creatures respond to the eclipse. I thought that was very cool. And then I've, I'm very fond of the ocean, and so I really wanted to see an eclipse uh, over the ocean, and so uh, I created these as well. So, uh, you know, thank you for allowing me to, to share with you some of the art that I've been inspired to create uh, uh, based on the sun. And, and now I want to challenge you. Go out there, get, get creative, make your own solar-inspired art in whatever form inspires you, whether that's photography or painting or sculpting, uh, you know, uh, anything that, uh, you know, that, that you enjoy doing to, to create, uh, you know, make some, make some solar-inspired art. Uh, in celebration of the, the Helo Physics Big Year uh, visual art theme. 
All right, so moving on to the, the meat uh, of the talk today, uh, this part uh, I'm going to talk to you about, uh, you know, the, the solar cycle and, and solar cycle maximum. So when I visited uh, with you uh, last time, uh, this was back in uh, 2021, so uh, almost three years ago uh, exactly, uh, we were at solar cycle minimum. So we had uh, just finished up uh, solar cycle 24. We were starting to see some hints of solar cycle 25 uh, emerging, but it it had very much, uh, you know, ve very much had not really uh, taken off yet. So it was very, very, very early in the solar cycle. I think we had just announced that uh, we had declared solar cycle minimum. Uh, you can see the, the sunspot uh, number progression here, and we just really hadn't gotten very far in solar cycle uh, 25. Uh, at that time, uh, I, I showed you this prediction uh, for uh, solar cycle 25, uh, uh, having a minimum uh, in April of 2020, plus or uh, minus six months, which we had uh, then said was actually December of 2019, so right at the beginning of that predictive window. Uh, I mentioned that that causes the, the curve to shift a little bit to uh, the left, uh, and that uh, you know we would expect to see a maximum a sunspot number maximum that was just a little bit larger than what we experienced in in solar cycle 24. And so three years ago, that's what I told you. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, what does the solar cycle look like now? How uh, how well does uh, my prediction hold or not hold? Uh, so looking at the solar cycle uh, progression now, we can see that uh, uh, cycle 25 is, is well underway. Uh, we can see the butterfly uh, wings have, have clearly begin, uh, begun to form. Uh, and we, we are uh, uh, you know, approaching uh, a maximum of an activity that's very similar to, to what we had for solar cycle uh, 25. And if we look closely at the sunspot number progression, we can see that the sunspot numbers are, are following very closely uh, along with the, the prediction that uh, we made in solar cycle 21. It does look like uh, it's a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit larger here, but uh, you know, following along very nicely uh, with what we had uh, predicted. Uh, maybe slightly higher than we predicted, but not significantly so. Uh, in the context of uh, you know, uh, many solar cycles, we see that it is shaping out to, to be, uh, again, consistent with uh, uh, still very much a weak cycle. Uh, you know, so uh, these would be considered large cycles. 23 is, is kind of the stereotypical uh, average cycle, uh, and 24 representing a, a smaller weak cycle. It does look like 25 is shaping up to be uh, very much a, a, a relatively weak cycle, although it does look like it, it is picking up to be just a, a little bit larger uh, than solar cycle uh, 24 which is very interesting in and of itself because of the uh, the Gleisberg cycle. So in addition to the 11 year uh, solar cycle, uh, that's uh, called uh, known as the, the Schwabe cycle, the 11 year periodicity, uh, there's an approximately uh, an 80 to 100 year periodicity that occurs with the solar activity cycle. Uh, and this is referred to as the Gleisberg cycle. And so we, we've been uh, for the last several um, solar cycles seeing this downward trend and solar uh, cycle activity. And this new uptick uh, in uh, solar cycle 25 uh, is, is indication that we might actually be coming out of that Gleisberg cycle and, and uh, moving into the next Gleisberg cycle, where we might start to see uh, increasing solar cycle uh, uh, amplitudes over the next uh, solar cycles. You know, the sun is, is never shy to, to show us through for, for you know, throw us for a loop. So, you know, we can't say for sure, but I would expect the general trend over the next several decades is that we'll start to see increasing solar activity uh, over the coming decades. Uh, at this stage uh, of the solar cycle, you can start to, to, to do additional things uh, to uh, characterize the, the solar cycle. You know, prior to the solar cycle, we are reliant on um, uh, uh, we are uh, reliant on um, 
uh, you, looking at the polar fields as a predictor, as a precursor to the solar cycle. And that's what we use to, to make our solar cycle predictions. But once the, the solar cycle has gotten well underway, uh, you can start to you know, fit the solar cycle uh, shape uh, with a curve fitting function. David Hathaway uh, param uh, created a param uh, parametric curve, uh, uh, a, a parametric equation for fitting the solar cycle as a function of four parameters. And he found that you could actually narrow this down to a function of two parameters, the, the start of the cycle and the amplitude of the cycle. And so once you uh, have gotten you know, far enough into the cycle, you can start to use curve fitting to get an estimate uh, for how strong the, the cycle might be. Uh, obviously, the more uh, you, uh, the further you go into the the solar cycle, uh, the more accurate that curve fitting technique uh, uh, comes to bear. Uh, so early on in the cycle, you see that it's a little bit all over the the place. But as uh, as you get about uh, uh, three years into the cycle, three to four years into the cycle, you get to uh, you get to you converge to about within ten percent of what the final uh, prediction value would be. And so if we use curve fitting uh, methods, uh, we find that uh, the solar cycle uh, is amplitude is going to be about a 135 uh, plus or minus 10. Uh, combined sunspot number predictions based on the, the magnetic precursors and the curve fitting at 30 months uh, into solar cycle 25 have been consistently at 134 plus or minus 8, again, slightly bigger than uh, the, 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 the panel predicted, uh, but not significantly so. So it is looking like uh, solar cycle 25 is definitely shaping up to be uh, another week cycle, slightly larger uh, than uh, cycle uh, uh, 24. And it's looking like, uh, you know, solar maximum, uh, we can expect solar maximum to be around fall of 2024. So again, uh, you know, we, we, we expect this to eclipse to, to coincide with nearly uh, the, the time of solar cycle maximum. I just want to caveat that a little bit because you know these these um, prediction curves that we we make these are very idealized curve uh, curves and if you look at the the structure of the sunspot cycle you'll see that there's a lot of these little bumps and wiggles that are actually characteristics of the 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 solar cycle and so this parametric curve doesn't really capture. Uh, this. In particular, there's a, a biannual oscillation, uh, a, a two-year signal that comes into play into the solar cycle. And you can see that uh, very clearly in, in solar cycle 24, where you have this, this peak at the beginning of the cycle, almost like a dip right at the time of solar cycle maximum, or solar cycle maximum, and then another peak uh, following the solar cycle maximum. So you know, you know, be careful when, when uh, you're talking about how you're defining solar cycle maximum. When I say solar cycle maximum, I'm talking about about the peak in that curve, which may not necessarily coincide with the actual peaks in the cycle. Actually, when you have these very weak cycles, these, these um, double peaks tend to be more pronounced. You can see hints of it here in, in 23, but as the cycle's amplitudes increases, they, they almost tend to, to merge to one another and, and they become uh, tend to be less apparent than they are with um, weaker cycles. And so I think that we've already experienced that that first peak here early uh, you know this past year. I think we're we're currently in 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 a, a dip similar to what we had uh, in the near the time of solar cycle 24 maximum. And then we'll expect another uh, peak in the cycle to occur probably uh, shortly following the the the, the solar cycle uh, maximum as defined by this this curve fitting. Uh, and just kind of closer look here. It looks like there's that first peak. We're maybe in a in a in a, a slightly quieter period, a, a dip here, uh, and uh, I would expect that we're probably going to see another uh, a peak uh, probably in about a year from now. Uh, so a, a little uptick in activity coming. So that's the outlook for the solar cycle. Uh, we have um, in addition to that. Uh, you know, the polar fields, uh, the sun's polar fields, um, uh, very uh, um, uh, uh, 
asymmetrically with the 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 the, the cycle. So they uh, when the solar cycle uh, is is peaking, uh, the polar fields are weak, and when the uh, solar cycle is at its minimum, the polar fields are strong. And so we typically see the timing of uh, the the polar field reversal uh, occurring at about the time of solar cycle maximum. And so this is another indication that we we might be close to to solar cycle maximum. Uh, this plot here on the left is some work that uh, uh, my postdoc and I have done where we've uh, uh, looked at the, the polar fields and we've used uh, the aft surface flux transport model that I discussed in our uh, my talk last time to make predictions about the, the timing of the, the polar field uh, reversal. And by doing an ensemble of, of simulations, we're, we're finding that the, the timing of the polar field reversal uh, in the northern hemisphere is, uh, looks like it's timed for about August of 2024. So it right uh, uh, about the summer this year. Uh, and then the, the southern polar fields will probably be reversing at about uh, February of 2025. So again, very consistent with uh, solar cycle maximum uh, occurring uh, uh, in uh, late this fall. So I think uh, uh, solar cycle maximum uh, is, is clearly well uh, upon us, uh, uh, is imminent, uh, and uh, uh, definitely something to, to, to keep uh, watching, and, and uh, especially as we uh, view the eclipse uh, next month. So next, I want to talk a little bit about uh, you know how we're going to round out the the heliophysics big year, uh, and that's uh, in December with uh, the uh, Parker Solar Probe's uh, perihelion. So perihelion is the closest approach, so the closest approach to the sun. Uh, before I get into that, I really want to give a little bit of background about who Eugene Parker was. Uh, Eugene Parker was just such a, a pioneering uh, uh, solar physicist, just a, just, a, just a powerhouse when it comes to, uh, to, to understanding uh, the sun, the environment uh, uh, that uh, it creates, uh, and how uh, it, uh, you know, how these different interactions uh, occur. Uh, so, so several major uh, scientific discoveries uh, uh, that Eugene Parker made included, uh, you know, the theorizing the existence of the solar wind. So, uh, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, you know, we thought that the the, the space in between the planets and the sun was just a pure vacuum. That there was nothing but ether that existed in this space. And so it was Parker that actually theorized the concept of the solar wind that came up with this idea, this notion of this steady stream of particles and energy radiating from the sun. Uh, and uh, this was such a uh, a controversial, uh, you know, idea so counter to what, uh, you know, the, the the scientists at that time believed uh, that he actually, the, 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 the reviewers, the referees to the paper, when he submitted this paper, he got rejected twice. It was actually Chandra Sekhar, who was the editor uh, of the journal, that said, no, this, this is really important work. And despite the referees uh, saying that, that it shouldn't be published, he pushed that work forward. Uh, and lo and behold, uh, only a few years later, uh, the, the existence of the, the solar wind was, was confirmed. Uh, and so just, just such a revolutionary to, to you know, have that kind of level of insight to, to, to conceive of uh, the solar wind. Uh, in addition to the, the solar wind, uh, he's theorized about uh, this uh, magnetic uh, structure that exists that the, the helio, uh, throughout the heliosphere. So as uh, the magnetic field uh, emerges from the sun, it becomes wrapped uh, by the rotation, much like uh, a water hose that's uh, the spinning. You'll see it uh, form these beautiful spirals. Well, he theorized that the the, the magnetic field that, that that's emanating uh, through the heliosphere, riding the solar wind, uh, would do a similar kind of thing, and so uh, created this idea of this this um, this Parker spiral, this boundary between the the north the uh, the positive and negative uh, polar uh, polar field uh, or the fields and and the, the the creation of a heliospheric current sheet. 
Uh, he uh, theorized, uh, 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 had, had great contributions to the ideas of magnetic reconnection, which we observe all over the sun in the form of, uh, you know, active regions. Uh, we see magnetic reconnection uh, occurring when uh, they uh, spur uh, uh, eruptions, so solar flares, coronal mass ejections. Uh, we see magnetic reconnection uh, in, the heat, uh, in the magnetosphere. So when a, a geomagnetic storm interacts with the Earth, magnetic field we get magnetic reconnection here and so he really he he was one of the uh you know the fathers of this this science of magnetic reconnection uh you know moving a little bit outside of the the realm of heliophysics he even uh proposed a mechanism known as the parker instability which would describe how the magnetic field of a galaxy can become unstable and lead to the formation of the spiral structure that we see in galaxies uh but similar uh to to some of the things that we see in the, the magnetic structures in the heliosphere. Uh, he was also fundamental in theorizing about the, the dynamics of the sun's corona and uh, uh, providing insights as to how uh, the coronal heating uh, uh, problem might occur. And so this is the notion that the, the sun's corona is millions of degrees, despite the fact that the solar surface is only about 5,000 or 6,000 degrees. And so he theorized that this could happen through, um, you know, small scale reconnections, nano, nano flares uh, occurring uh, uh, over uh, the entire heliosphere. And so really, uh, you know, Eugene Parker was just uh, a great among greats, uh, just contributed so much to the field of, of solar physics. Uh, so it really uh, is, is no surprise uh, that uh, he was honored uh, by being, uh, having this, uh, this uh, the Parker Solar Probe uh, uh, be his namesake named after him, just because he, he just contributed so much uh, to the field of solar physics. Uh, so Parker Solar Probe uh, launched in, in 2018, uh, you know, with the, the mission of uh, studying the sun's coronal up close and personal, uh, really uh, getting in uh, close to the, the sun to be able to measure uh, the solar wind and the magnetic fields uh, very, very, very close to the sun within the sun itself, uh, you know, if you uh, practically. Uh, and then the way that it proposed to do this is to, to perform a series of uh, Venus graduate gravitational assist. And so these are uh, where a spacecraft uh, positions itself in an orbit very, very close to a, a, a planet so that it can slingshot around that uh, uh, planet and, and increase the eccentricity of its orbit. And so moving from a circular orbit into a more elongated orbit. And so with each Venus flyby that Parker, uh, Parker Solar Probe performs, it will bring uh, Parker Solar Probe closer and closer uh, to, the, to, the, to the surface of the sun. So on uh, October of 2018, uh, it became the, the, the closest ever artificial object to the sun. Uh, the previous record holder to that was uh, back in 1976. So this is no small feat. Uh, it's taken many, 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 uh, several decades to, to get there. Uh, as of its perihelion uh, in uh, uh, last year, uh, Parker Solar Probe's closest approach was about 7.26 million kilometers or 4.51 uh, million uh, miles uh, from the sun. And so as it uh, makes each of these uh, uh, orbits uh, around Venus, uh, diving uh, deeper, uh, uh, deeper and deeper, to, uh, closer and closer to the surface of the sun, the so Parker Solar Probe has already made several very influential, very important discoveries. Uh, during its eighth flyby, uh, I think this was uh, a, a couple of years ago, uh, it was during its eighth uh, Venus flyby, or eighth uh, flyby, uh, Parker flew uh, for the first time. Uh, we can say that Parker actually flew into the atmosphere, into the corona of the sun. Uh, they determined this by uh, measuring the uh, magnetic and particle uh, conditions. So at this point, it was 18.8 .8 solar radii. So the, the, the different distance between uh, the sun's center and its surface times 18.8. .8. So within uh, 
uh, 20 solar radii. Uh, they measured the magnetic field and the particles there and uh, confirmed that the plasma environment at that point was technically what would be considered within the solar corona. So it's actually touched the sun, the first uh, man-made uh, probe to actually uh, go within uh, the sun and, and touch the sun, measure the sun directly. Uh, by doing that, it's been able to, to make in situ measurements of the, the solar wind. So measuring the, the, the particles, the magnetic field, the, the strength of, and the velocity uh, of those particles. Uh, it detected that, um, uh, uh, that the, the, while the, the solar wind, while it was still rotating, uh, it detected that the rotation starting more than 20 miles from the sun uh, and the speed of the rotation increased as the probe uh, approached its closest point to the sun. So measuring the, the, the rotation of that, that solar wind as it moves into that close approach to the sun. Uh, it discovered a dust-free zone uh, that had been long theorized but never actually confirmed. Uh, so uh, Parker Solar Probe uh, found that there was a, comic, a cosmic dust that began to, to thin out about 7 million miles from the sun. So there's this region very close to the sun where this, this cosmic dust has just basically been evacuated. It's been blown away by the, the solar wind, creating this, this dust-free zone. Uh, new perspectives and, and space weather, you know, measuring these energetic particles, it's shedding new light on, on uh, uh, energetic uh, eruptions and how space weather events occur and, and then how they're accelerated. Um, magnetic funnels uh, on the, uh, and the coronal's heating. So uh, this is going back to, you know, the idea about how does the coronal heating problem, uh, you know, what causes the coronal heating problem. And so what Parker observed were uh, these uh, strange Flips, these switchbacks in the magnetic field uh, and, and that were interestingly and surprisingly uh, related to the supergranule structures on the sun. And so definitely shedding some, some light onto you know, how these processes, uh, this magnetic uh, reconnections and funneling of the magnetic field and the energy might be heating the corona. Uh, and then uh, additionally, uh, you know, uh, outside of the sun, uh, it's it's making discoveries uh, about Venus. So uh, while performing its Venus gravity assists, uh, Parker made groundbreaking observations of a dust ring uh, around uh, Venus and, and found that the that Venus actually has a comet-like tail of plasma that trails behind uh, 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 Venus. And so in addition to, to, to solar physics, we're getting some planetary uh, physics uh, in the mix. So uh, you know, this is just just the start uh, of of what's going on with Parker. There's certainly much more to occur with every Venus flyby, with every uh, uh, perihelion. Uh, Parker is getting closer to uh, closer and closer to the sun. At its most uh, recent uh, approach, it set records for both the closest approach to the sun and the fastest uh, speed of any man-made object. And so we got these numbers right here. You can check out the Parker Solar Probe uh, page to see uh, uh, see where what kind of records uh, Parker is is uh, making and and the countdowns to the next uh, approach. So it looks like we got about five days to the next uh, closer approach. So we have another one imminently. Uh, and uh, most importantly, the the, uh, the 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 approach that occurs in December. Uh, 2022, uh, or excuse me, de December uh, 2024. So late uh, at the end of this year, at the time, at the end of our heliophysics big year, is is what we're they're calling the the first close approach. So really, really diving into the sun and making the closest uh, measurements of uh, ever obtained uh, of the sun. It'll be followed by a few other uh, very close um, perihelions uh, in 2025. Uh, and then the orbits will start to, um, I think they go a little bit further out from there. So definitely a lot more discoveries to make. So I just want to uh, conclude just with a, just a summary of, of the various different things that I talked about today. You know, the eclipse in, in April next month, make the effort, if at all possible, go to the path of totality, uh, you know, getting even 99.9% .9 close to totality 
is not totality and it is not the same as seeing totality. It's just literally the difference between night and day, whether or not you're you're getting what appears to be a, sh a, a shadow, a, 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 a dimming of the sun versus going to, to, to nighttime, going to, to pitch black. Uh, May uh, 2024, uh, join me in, in celebrating the sun in visual forms, uh, you know, do, you know, whatever you, uh, whatever way you like to create, whether it's uh, uh, you know painting, uh, digital media, photography, uh, you know, find your own ways to um, uh, celebrate the sun in in visual forms. Uh, look forward to you know the the, the continued year of, of solar cycle maximum. We are, solar cycle maximum is upon us. We'll continue to see this this uh, maximum activity probably for another about a year or two uh, before we'll start to really see uh, the declining phase of the the solar cycle. Uh, and then rounding out the year uh, in December with uh, Parker's uh, perihelion and certainly uh, more uh, discoveries. Uh, to come. And so with that, uh, I don't know, do we have time for questions and comments? Oh, we absolutely do. Wonderful. Absolutely. Great, great. great. Um, thank you. That was really interesting. That was great. Uh, I mean, Franco has always uh, kind of gotten me even more interested in the sun with all of the pictures that he's been taking over the years. And yeah. And so um, for you to fill in the blanks like this on all these other little things. And, and obviously we were talking about the Parker Solar Probe before the talk too. Yeah. I love all this stuff. I think it's just, it's just shocking. And that, that, the, I know that you were talking numbers there, how fast yeah. it was going to go, but yeah. it's going to go to put this into miles per hour, which I think most of us here in America yeah. go, it's 430,000 miles an hour at its closest uh, yeah. approach to the sun. That's right. That is a phenomenal speed. That is, mm -hmm. it's hard to imagine how fast that is. Yeah, yeah, and really that is is due to those uh, those uh, those Venus gravi gravity assists that allow that orbit to be uh, elongated by having that elliptical orbit. You know, uh, elliptical orbits have this property that you know the the, the further out you are uh, in the orbit, the the slower you are, and the and the cl uh, the closer into the to perihelion. Uh, you know, you really pick up that speed. That gravity really starts to take hold, and it literally you know slingshots you around. Uh, that body that you're orbiting and you can just pick up so much speed so much velocity uh through those types of maneuvers and and uh really it really just is astounding to to see what we've, we've been able to accomplish with parker obviously if you're in the enterprise you end up going back to 1930s uh 30s earth so that's that's always a, a nice surprise when you <laughs> close to the sun there yeah, yeah. So I know that we're on solar um, solar cycle 25. Yeah. And that's an 11 year cycle. So we go back 265 years. Yeah. Who did who observed solar cycle one? How did where did the where did the numbers come from? Who who was mm -hmm. that person and and what did they see and how did they observe the, the sun? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so actually, um, let me see if I can go back to a figure here. I don't know if it really illustrates it here. But it might get a little. Uh, no, I don't have it on this one. Okay, there's different one. So uh, solarcyclescience.com, I've got uh, on my website, there's a, there's some pictures that illustrate this. I guess I can talk about it a little bit. Uh, so really, um, you know, it wasn't until uh, the 1800s, uh, I think there was a, a scientist by the name of uh, uh, Charles Schwabe, and he was the really the first person that was, um, you know, he was an avid uh, astronomer, just like all of you. And he just enjoyed going out every day and looking at the sun. And he was meticulous in making observations of the sunspot. And he actually, you know, he was he was so consistent and so regular that he 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 created one of the first, you know, really um, uh, you know. Uh, formative data sets that we, we use to, to make this. And so uh, he, he discovered by looking at data from uh, Maunder uh, uh, that uh, the you know, if you plot this data, uh, this sunspot period, uh, this sunspot data as a function of time, then you get this 11 year periodicity. So uh, that was, I think, uh, in the early 1800s. So we were already, you know, about a dozen cycles uh, into to looking at the sun before, you know, that really, uh, you know, 
came to to bear that the, the solar cycles uh, existed. Um, you know, a lot of those previous uh, solar cycles are have been uh, created through uh, you know historical uh, reconstructions, digging through historical data. Uh, the Royal Greenwich Observatory has been uh, measuring uh, you know sunspots for for. For you know, uh, for 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 hundred like uh, over hundred uh, like almost two hundred years since the mid seventeen uh, hundreds, uh, and so you know they really uh, you know had a lot of the observations from the sun that we're able to go back and and really you know look carefully at those and and start counting. Uh, you know we know that the sunspot number existed prior to those observations, but really those um you know the first you know one two three four are the first where you know, we had enough data to really characterize those solar cycles and start to say, okay, yes, that is a solar cycle one right there and solar cycle two, that's clearly the next solar cycle. And so really our counting is based on, you know, the, the, the availability of the data that we have uh, to us. You know, there have been several uh, scientists in the last decade have that have really been working very hard to try to extend those sunspot records. We've got historians, you know, solar historians that are going through, they're combing through, you know, all the possible archives that they can find of any solar, you know, solar observatory anywhere, looking at, you know, ancient writings and texts to try to to see if they can, you know, fill in more solar cycles. But I think at this point, you know, we we we've started that counting system, even if we're able to add a few more cycles prior to that, uh, I think we're, we'll, we'll stick to this current numbering system. Very nice. Okay. Um, from Kalamazoo, Stephen uh, Schreier had asked a question too, is there a correlation between solar cycles and climate change? So could the ice ages have been caused by solar cycle variations? And he wanted to thank you for a great presentation. And he really, really loved that crazy AI that you were showing there earlier. Those were <laughs> Shocking. I was trying to figure out that first, the first images, it didn't dawn on me that that was AI as I was seeing that. The, the, yeah, that one. I thought, well, this is some sort of a cool science thing. This is this is like data that I've never seen before. But no, it's it's AI. But yeah, yeah, man, that yeah. is eye candy. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I uh, appreciate the question and the uh, and the compliments. Uh, so, you know, certainly uh, the the sun, we, we, the earth is embedded in the, the, the sun's environment. You know, the, the solar system, the heliosphere is all an environment that's created by the sun. So certainly uh, there is uh, some impact of the, the solar variability on the earth's climate, but it, it's it's at the levels of fractions of a percent. So the major metric that we use to measure uh, the this the, the component, the, the amount of impact that we have uh, from the sun is, a, is a, a measurement called the total solar irradiance. And, and we see that if we look very, very closely, again, to the, the fractions of a percent, very dive in very close, zoom in very, very close, we do see that there is a, a, a solar cycle-like periodicity to it. But it, it's not... Uh, a substantial change. It's not a big enough change, I think, to 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 really describe a lot of the 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 climate patterns that we've seen. Uh, I, I I'm not sure about the uh, the the ice age in particular. You know, there's there's so many different aspects that can come into play and 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 affect the climate. I think the ice age uh, was believed to be more uh, likely caused by uh, uh, a uh, a catastrophic um, earth impact. Uh, you know, but there's all kinds of different things that can change uh, cause major changes uh, to the climate in uh, the uh, you know. Is it the uh, there was the the little ice age that occurred a a, a few hundred years ago that was a, that uh, we now know is very much attributed was a localized phenomena that's attributed uh, you know all across Europe there was this this increased cooling it was very very cold in Europe uh, for a very extended period of time we now know that that's a, that was caused due to uh, volcanic eruptions and so I think uh, the 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 bigger uh, Thing, there, there are much bigger uh, things acting on our climate that are forcing the climate than the the variability that we're seeing on the sun. Interesting. So that was called the like the Monar Minute or um, minimum, right? Uh, yeah. So the Little Ice Age did happen to to coincide with the Monar minimum, and there were actually for a long time there was a belief that maybe uh, that that Little Ice Age 
could have been caused by uh, the Maunder minimum. But I think the research is now uh, pointing to because it was not necessarily a global phenomenon, it was very um, localized to Europe. Uh, they now believe that that was actually more uh, a coincidence that it happened to occur at the time around the time of, of Maunder minimum and was more likely associated with the uh, volcanic uh, eruptions that were occurring uh, in in that region of the world. Uh, and so they've got they've gotten measurements. Uh, originally, they they thought that there was a correlation to the Maunder minimum because most of the measurements uh, came from Europe. <laughs> uh, since then, they've begun to to get measurements from other parts of the world, and they've realized that that was actually uh, a regional phenomenon, not a global phenomenon. And so they've kind of moved away from thinking that that uh, was a solar uh, a solar type of phenomenon in our climate. All right. Chris Hartnett uh, asked a question over on YouTube. Uh, what temperature does the Parker probe get to internally? Oh, wow. Uh, you know, I I don't know off the top of my head, so I don't actually uh, work we'll just with, go with Parker hot. data. Really, really, uh, really hot. But, there, but there's a lot of really cool science, a lot of really cool things to think about here. So number one, uh, Parker does have a solar shade that's specifically designed to protect it from the heat. And so these are very, very highly, highly, highly re reflective uh, solar shields that help protect the, the instruments from uh, changing much in temperature. And those those instruments have to uh, be very stable in order to, to, to keep quality measurements. As soon as you start changing uh, the temperature uh, of those instruments, you start changing uh, how those electronics work and, and you can get, um, uh, uh, air, you can get, uh, that can contribute to uh, your signal, right? And so you can get uh, uh, errors in your signal due to changes in temperature. So you really have to keep that temperature uh, stable. The other thing to think about, so even though the corona is very, very hot, uh, the corona is also, um, uh, is is uh, not dense at all. And so what I mean by that is, you know, in the context of what we think about in our atmosphere, um, you know, there's the, the it, our atmosphere is very, very dense comparatively. And, uh, and so you have lots and lots of lots of particle uh, interactions. The, the denser uh, a material is, the more particle uh, interactions that you will have. And so the corona is very, 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 very diffuse. And so even though the particles, the temperature of those particles uh, is very, very high uh, and are associated with particles that are, are consistent with millions of degrees of temperatures, that 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 area that Parker exists in isn't, you know, a, 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 ball, a bubble uh, at millions of degrees. Those particles that might interact with it may be millions of degrees, but because they are the, that material is so diffuse, uh, it's not able to transfer that heat as well. And so you've got a couple of things working to its advantage. That's that that's, that solar shield number one, but also uh, that diffuseness of the material means that there's not um, a large amount of particle interactions that are going to cause that heat transfer uh, to 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 overwhelm uh, Parker's uh, instrumentation, and so the in, the Parker itself is probably maintaining again. Uh, not my area of expertise. I don't know the 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 material, the constraints that were set on Parker, but those are kinds of things that you know. Before you even launch, uh, you have to demonstrate to NASA that you are able to maintain certain levels of temperature. Uh, and so I'm I'm sure that they've done that. I'm sure there's documentations on their their website or uh, in the literature that can give you those numbers. I just don't know them off the top of my head. Franco's got a question. Uh, what do you got, Franco? Yeah, I actually wanted to ask what is the focus of your research right now and what are the major questions that solar scientists are trying to resolve at this point? I mean, you know, it's a big question, but, you know, it's short. Yeah, yeah. Well, so definitely, you know, uh, you know, one of my passions and one of my major areas of research is, uh, you know, trying to understand the solar activity cycle. Uh, so I'm uh, continuing with modeling uh, surface flux transport. Uh, 
uh, measuring flows on the surface of the sun. We've gotten uh, I've gotten some new uh, publications in the last year with some updated measurements of flows on the surface of the sun, uh, improving uh, models of surface flux transport and trying to you know understand and predict the solar activity cycle. So that's my 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 major area of, of focus. Uh, but I'm also interested in in using surface flux transport uh, as a as a bridge between understanding the solar interior and being able to make uh, space weather predictions. So I also have been working with uh, people who do coronal modeling and uh, heliospheric modeling uh, to try to make space weather predictions as well, to make predictions about the solar wind, uh, you know, timings of, you know, eruptions and, and how they might impact the, the earth. And so uh, kind of a, a, a broad gamut, I would say, but mostly, you know, focused around, you know, surface flux transport, the role that plays in the solar cycle, making predictions about the solar cycle, uh, you know, providing coronal modelers with a uh, inner boundary condition to seed their models and, and improving uh, our maps. So uh, looking at, uh, you know, how we might be able to use helioseismology to improve our, our maps of the magnetic surface of the sun so that when we are uh, putting those uh, 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 images into those uh, models, uh, they make be better predictions. So looking at far side helioseismology, incorporating that into the models is a, is a big area uh, of research right now. Is it, is it mostly through analysis of data or do you also have observation of the sun through telescopes or? Yeah, so um, so in terms of uh, trying to improve uh, the surface flux transport model with far side observations, uh, you know we had the Stereo missions, which were a, a a a twin pair of satellites that left from the Earth uh, in opposite directions and went around the backside of the Sun before returning to Earth. They actually just recently, this past year, uh, uh, returned to to the to the Earth. Uh, uh, position in that that orbit. We did lose one of those spacecraft, but both of those spacecraft were operating uh, uh, for uh, about four to five years. And so we thought have about four to five years where we have high quality EUV images of the backside of the sun. And so one of the things that I've been working on is seeing um, how can we uh, use those EUV images since it didn't have a magnetograph, we don't have mag measurements of the magnetic field on the far side of the sun. How can we use those EUV images uh, to uh, inform our models and, and uh, make improvements to the model by using those EUVs as proxies for the far side uh, magnetic field? Uh, I've also been uh, recently been working with helioseismology data uh, and, and using that as, as uh, potentials to inform. Uh, you know, there's still quite a bit of uncertainty associated with those data. It's certainly um, you know, not a, a substitution for or, you know, uh, 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 direct observations, uh, uh, but uh, they certainly are uh, an improvement over, you know, a blank slate of not knowing anything about what's going on the far side. So we definitely can improve surface flux transport with those. And I think those helioseismology techniques have just really, there's been a lot of work uh, developing those helioseismology techniques using AI and machine learning to uh, improve, uh, you know, our, our uh, uh, our helioseismic results and and have better uh, information about what's occurring on the far side of the sun. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from the panel? No, I have one. So I, I, I was as I was kind of listening through. Unless Shannon, were you hopping in there? No. <laughs> oh, I saw the light pop in. Um, so how far out can you predict a solar cycle? I know we're in twenty five. Can you tell yeah. us what what we can expect eleven years from now? What are we are we gonna I was surprised to hear you say that this is a smaller cycle. Yeah. I really thought it was kind of doing pretty active. But... Well, yeah, and, and 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 I think that's why it's really important to you know put it in the context. Uh, am I still sharing my screen? I no, I'm sorry. I, I stopped screens. Okay. I wanted to see your face for a little bit because because okay. okay, sure, it's only sure. like one little picture. Of... <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think that's why it's important to put it in the context. Actually, I have it right here. Uh, it's, that's why it's important to put it in the context of of the you know previous solar cycles, and we can see. Uh, you know, compared to solar cycle 24, yeah, there, there's a little bit of an uptick, but it's definitely much weaker than what we had for solar cycle 23 and going back even further to solar cycle uh, 22 and solar cycle 21, which would have been considered large solar cycles. You know, solar cycle 25, 
we're grateful that we got that solar activity and, and have an opportunity to, to study it and explore, but it, it, it still is very much in the realm of a week, uh, so what would be considered a week solar cycle. Uh, again, uh, you know, for your reference, solar cycle 23 right here, uh, that's the stereotypic, if you average the last 20, the, the last 24 cycles, you're going to get a cycle that looks just like that. That's the stereotypical average cycle. And, and 25 is still, you know, a good, good, good head uh, below that. So, uh, you know, so it's definitely uh, 25 is consistent with a, a week cycle. In terms of prediction and what we, uh, you know, how far can we predict and, and what might we expect, um, you know, really, uh, you know, we're, the sun is a, a very dynamic body. There's a lot uh, going on there. Uh, and in particular, uh, you know, one of the major um, sources of um, activity on the sun is, is related to the, the convective motions on the sun, this boiling this, of, of the plasma. And depending on the specifics of how that uh, convective motions interacts with emerging active regions can really change uh, the evolution of the polar fields. And so uh, while we can we, we can get a general idea in terms of trends, in terms of being able to do um, uh, meaningful predictions, we really are only able to do that about um, I'd say about five years ahead of solar cycle minimum uh, is, is the earliest that you can start to get uh, uh, some sense of, of what the, the next cycle might hold. Great, thank you. And the reason um, for that, oh, sorry, and the reason for that is that, you know, uh, you know one or two uh, active regions, depending on how they evolve, can significantly alter the way that the polar fields evolve. And that polar fields, as the source uh, of the, the next cycle, um, you know, really can, 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 can swing the, the needle. You know, that being said, uh, you know, there is a little bit of, of a memory. And so you don't typically expect from one cycle to next to go from, you know, the strongest cycle to the weakest cycle. You know, bearing in mind that, you know, there are exceptions to every rule, and we did see a big jump from solar cycle 19 down to 20. But generally, you know, there, there, there seems to be, you know, an ebb and flow. Uh, and, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there's this, this um, you know, 80 to 100 year periodicity, which would tend to suggest, uh, you know, that uh, we may be entering uh, a period of uh, increasing solar cycle activity over the next solar cycles. So, um, you know, I won't give you a number and say that solar cycle 26 is going to be, you know, this size. <laughs> but, you know, if I were to just take a stab based on the general trends, I would expect fact that solar cycle 26 is probably going to be larger than 25. Um, you know, is it slightly or significantly so? I really can't say. And 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 might the sun throw us for a loop and do something completely uh, uh, unexpected? <laughs> it's uh, it's prone to do this. So <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't bet my first child on it. But uh, uh, I'm certainly happy to make a stab in the dark that it might be a larger solar cycle. Uh, and and for the next several solar cycles, we might start to see some increasing activity. We'll put you down as a definite maybe on that then. <laughs> a definite maybe for sure. <laughs> All right. Any uh, any other questions from the panel or from anybody else? We're keeping an eye on it here. Um, if there's anything else you'd like to add, I don't see anything in YouTube. Um, our panel? Anybody? All right. Well, I believe we're going to stick a fork in this. So that was great. Thank you again uh, for a being yeah, um, another good. great guest. And you know, I'm another uh, couple years down the road here again. We're we're going to have you back again. Uh, we yeah, really I'll tell you what to expect for cycle 26. <laughs> right. We'll have you back to discuss how dead it is and there's nothing going on in the sun. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me again. Always a pleasure to talk to all of you and, and really to see just the phenomenal, uh, you know, astrophotography that uh, all of you have been able to, to do. Uh, it's just really just stunning uh, to see those images. Franco, oh, you got to send me more. <laughs> Love those. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, he's very, very good. So that's going to wrap up uh, this month's um, Westport Astronomical Society free lecture series. But next month, we are uh, hosting Robert A. Simcoe. He is the director 
at uh, MIT at the Kavli Institute for Astrophysics and Space Research. So another really big heavy hitter joining us next month as well. And we do hope that uh, you find the eclipse someplace, find totality. If you can't, if you're not going to be traveling and you're going to stick around Westport, come see us at the Westport uh, Library. And we'll be out there again on April 8th from 2 until 4 with all sorts of great safe ways uh, for you to uh, view the partial eclipse in Westport. And again, it's about 90%. So uh, again, thank you so much to Lisa Upton and everybody that joined us on Zoom and YouTube and everywhere else across the world and across the country. Thanks again. We'll see you next month. Bye, everybody.